Welcome in Amsterdam. This is the Eurocree Daily. We share your passion for hospitality excellence. Thank you. Always difficult at the end of the afternoon to uh, keep everybody awake, but I will give it a shot. Uh, what I wanted to do today with you is first talk a little bit about passion itself, show you quickly what Citizen M is, not so important, but to better put it in perspective, what we do with passion and how we create passion with our ambassadors, our staff. And that I do think is very interesting. So I want to give you a quick presentation, take you through it, and maybe uh, even indulge you in some questions and make it more two-way, 2.0, than uh, just uh, one way. Um, when I was preparing and I was thinking about passion, it's very difficult. Innovation is easy because you create. But passion, what is passion? And um, it's pretty, about, pretty abstract, don't you think? Passion, go and get me some passion, please. That's pretty, pretty hard to do. And it's basically a word that we use that we load. And it's the load on the other side that either gives us a good feeling and energizes us, so passion had an effect, but passion by itself is just a, a dead word. So, what I feel is that it's more a reflection, the actions on the other side, the circumstances, the emotion, everything that happens around it, that makes it more interesting and it loads passion. But passion itself is a farce. Passion comes from energy. Passion needs to be created. And what we try to do when we create at Citizen M is look at that innovation with our passion, our vision, and in creating it, we did every step of the way and looked at everything. So I will highlight only today the recruitment and the training where I think our guest satisfaction comes from in the end, which is our, our staff and our ambassadors. So allow me to quickly take you through uh, Citizen M and uh, tell you about our brand. About six years ago, uh, my partners and I got together and each were associated one way or the other with uh, the hospitality industry. We had uh, either invested in hotels, supplied hotels, run hotels, and been associated one way or the other. And we felt that nothing really was happening. If you look in other industries, there's a tremendous uh, re uh, reinvention. Uh, there are quantum leaps being made. Think of the uh, car industry, the technology. Um, every couple of years, something completely new appears in front of you. And in the hospitality industry, I think that uh, some uh, 40, 50 years ago, uh, Holiday Inn came with a double queen room. <laughs> and uh, I think that Mr. Ian Schrager, uh, 10, 15 years ago, came up with some cool boutique hotels. Um, anybody else? Oh yeah, we painted a white wall gray. That was innovation. <laughs> Nothing is happening. So what we said, what we wanted to do is start completely new and take a look at what does a contemporary traveler need. And when I say start anew, really take off that entire backpack with all the thoughts and beliefs, maybe with all the educators here, not the smartest thing to take that off, but for now let's put it to rest. And what we did is we looked at it, how we could create answers to today's questions of travelers. So, when we started out, we had our vision set and our mission to go and create a luxury contemporary hotel for the cost conscious traveler. We call it affordable luxury for the people or to have something incredible that's still payable. Not easy. What we said is let's pick our target audience because target audience is something we have an ever growing uh, amount of people traveling. And we felt it was very important to take a niche out of that and not create something for everybody. So we took only a space of frequent travelers, people that are on the road 50, 100, 150 days a year. And because of their frequent travel, whether that is for business or leisure, have a certain need. Here are some of the characteristics that we thought. We created our rooms in a factory. Why? Very simple, because the cost of construction is expensive, so we said let's create a room that is small but very effective 
and created in the factory, so our building cost goes down. So you see, innovation or limitations were not necessarily things that would withhold us. So in the end, we created a huge uh, manufacturing process, and this is in a plant in Liverpool. We can build our hotels basically in any um, unit manufacturing plant, and we just take some space out of the line of production. And when I say that we create a room, I really mean we create a room. Our rooms are completely tested, and later sealed in the factory, and if you see as the forklift truck picks it up, you see that the television is in there, the lights are on, everything is functional, um, water is tested, heating is tested, everything is done. And we put it on the truck, and we bring it to the site. And at the site, what we do is we just prepare our um, foundation, put up a steel construction, and then we still love playing, we lay go. And we just put up the hotel. Um, in the south of Amsterdam, we have a hotel that the stagging of the building took 15 working days. There were people that went on vacation and came back and found a hotel in their backyard. <laughs> Once we put the roof over it, it's watertight again, and we can unwrap our little present. And this is how uh, our hotel at Schiphol looks, 230 uh, rooms, first hotel that we opened uh, a little uh, oh, two and a half years ago now. Um, how could we find this location? Um, Traditional hotels were able to build uh, about 80 to 90 rooms at that location. We have 230 rooms. So space, when we asked our guests, was not a premium they were willing to pay for. So what we ended up doing is not providing them space. And we're successful and did some other things that I will show you. This um, is our hotel in Amsterdam, 215 rooms. And the same really there counts that nobody thought that they could build a hotel with that many rooms at that location. And what we do is we nestle our hotels close to five-star properties. So what happens in effect is that we become affordable luxury. So you will not find us necessarily next to um, some budget hotels and be a very beautiful budget hotel. We, we just turn it around. This is our hotel in Glasgow that we just opened uh, this summer, uh, 200 rooms. And we are under construction in London. This is a hotel right behind the Tate Modern. This is a hotel we're building in London, right on top of the Tower Hill tube station. And we're going to New York. We have two locations, one at Times Square and one on Bowery Soho. This is all a little bit to give you an idea of how an innovative concept can grow fairly rapidly. We think it's too slow, but we're now five, five and a half years at it. And, and growing. This is uh, how you come in. Uh, at the entrance there is not a reception desk because we felt that if we uh, do electronic reservations that would be the easiest for people and chances that you know how to spell your own name are pretty good. So we figured that you then also can find your name in a kiosk where you are so used to like an ATM where you get your money or check in uh, when you're at the airport. And we have had now some 250,000 people check in and check out at our hotels. And the average is about two minutes in a check-in and about uh, 30 seconds check out. That includes payment. And um, the interesting thing is, is that where the hotelier said, I, are you nuts? You're going to not have a reception desk, people, hospitality? I mean, you're going to have a machine? And guess what the guest re reaction is? Thank you for giving me control over a process again that I hate. Because they show up at the desk, the desk clerk is busy, you're a nuisance, and it's not a nice experience. So what we have done with our ambassadors, they're positioned right there, they grab your eyes upon uh, entry of the hotel, and they're there if, they need, if you need assistance. So high guest satisfaction by doing it differently. In my house, I don't know with you, but uh, I have a living room, a dining room, but the epic center of my house is the kitchen. So what we have done is when you walk into our hotel, you walk basically into the kitchen. Why? Because that's where I want to make a cup of coffee for you and welcome you into my home. So we have created a space that uh, is a concoction between a Pret-a-Manger and a uh, Starbucks and a place where you can have a nice drink. 
And what we do is we uh, have our ambassadors, and I spend a lot of time later on that, basically make you feel at home, feel at ease. And the human element comes out much more. What we don't have is a restaurant. Because frequent travelers are on the road, and when they want to eat, they go into the city. I heard some people already that uh, they made some good uh, uh, reservations for tonight. But I think that uh, often you come back to the hotel at uh, 8, 9 o'clock, and the only thing you want to do is, like, when you come home late, open your fridge, see what's in it, and snack. That's basically what we provide. Great strip of sushi, some salads, some sandwiches, but it's not a full meal. Then what we created is environments where people would feel comfortable. So um, in this area, for instance, it's a long table and a bar area whereby people sit together instead of being placed at a little table of two and look at somebody else being lonely at the table of two. And you sort of don't walk up and say, hi, I'm Michael. You sort of <laughs> you smile at each other and that's about it. So in our hotels, we create environments where people sort of meet up because you're sitting at the same table, you might as well talk. These are some impressions of the hotel. Social areas, just very easy, uh, friendly places to meet. I want to stop for a moment at uh, the ambassadors. Uh, one of the things that we felt that was very important from hospitality is that the human component is more important than anything else. And the human component is not, man, did you have a nice trip? Because really there's no load to that. The same as, as what is the load of passion. So what we have done with our ambassadors, and I will show you how we recruit them and train them, I want personalities, I want characters. And yes, we put them on a uniform, but they're uniforms that they can fit and do to their own uh, liking. So they're jackets, uh, sweaters, uh, um, for the ladies' dresses, not for the men. But, uh, but we do allow them a lot of uh, flexibility because uh, here you see Pedro, who has a little piercing. Well, for those that don't know, that happens. When you go outside, you meet those people. So I don't know why we don't have them in our hotels. So it does not have to be that there's only piercings. That's maybe a little much. But if there's a little tattoo or an expression, that's what we want and we want culture to come out. We want people to be themselves. Um, then we created living spaces. And our lobby is not a lobby, but our living rooms. So you have dining areas, living areas, you have the remote control laying around. There are tables where you can work. Because the hybrid traveler today sits with their earphones, has their computer with them, and just wants Wi-Fi, and they don't want to be bothered. So. What we do is we provide all that free. And in the mid-market, when you travel, we were thinking, and it's not innovation, somebody said that already on the little clip. Innovation is not creating something anew, but it is thinking so what is currently necessary is available. So when you travel in the mid-market and you do that a lot, there's one thing you're not allowed to put on your expense report, that is movies. So we give them for free. What a revelation that is. <laughs> And really, it doesn't cost us a lot, trust me. But it is just the thinking of those things that irritate, take them away, give a little bit more, make it human, and the whole thing works. So these are some of the areas in our hotel that we have. And you see, it's always prepared for uh, a lot of people just to be comfortable. Our corridors, usually corridors are pretty boring, so we went to Google Earth and we took a print of the city, so you can walk over the city when you go to your room. These are our rooms. Uh, they're 14 and a half square meters, and uh, they provide, the, the lighting is not really optimal, but uh, I hope you can see it. It's a very efficient, it's a king size bed, two by 220, very comfortable, highest quality of linen. We have two cylinders, one is a shower, one is a, a, a bathroom, and we have in the room, a lot of gadgets. So the gadgets allow you to, for instance, from one handheld piece, a little mood pad, to control the window treatment, the temperature, the lighting, the television. So you can do everything. Thank you, sir. Perfect. Um, for those that want to go to sleep, it's safe. <laughs> um, so, so what we do is in the room, we overcompensate for a small room with high aesthetics, 
and with, uh, you know, quality uh, technology. You can set it to every liking. And, um, this is our room in Glasgow. We can value engineer and we can move forward. It's a mass production that each time we get better at. This one is 20% cheaper after the value engineering. We took out all the special pieces and are now taking off the shelf pieces to, uh, to construct. We won a lot of awards, very nice, but it's all the industry patting each other on the back. There is one award that we really are proud of, and that is where I think the story that I want to tell you today begins. We got from TripAdvisor, the trendiest hotel of the world. Behind us are the Standard in New York that opened up from Andre Bellage. There are several W's with a small company called Starwood behind it. So there are some that, uh, that made that same list. So we're extremely proud, not necessarily because we're number one, but it is the guest who chooses this. We had nothing to do with it. We didn't even know what happened. So we're extremely proud of it. So let me take you on the journey of what it takes in order to provide excellent service. And excellent service, now that you've seen a little bit of the product, um, to remind you, I give very small rooms, I make you make your own reservation, I make you check in yourself, I make you get your own food, I make you check out yourself, I will make the room for you, I will smile at you, and if you go to TripAdvisor, we are in Amsterdam ranked in the absolute top. 370 hotels, we're in the top 10 with both hotels. Last hour we're number one, and we're open only several months. So how can you get guest satisfaction that high when an average hotelier would say, yeah, but you're not doing anything for them. That's right. So, what we said when we started out with that clean uh, slate is we said, how does the interaction look between the guest and the ambassador? Well, I, I saw that happening. I wanted friendly. I wanted human. I wanted kind. I wanted sympathetic. I wanted honest. I wanted quick, <clears throat> caring. So I could describe that. And then I said, well, if I see how that interaction is, then I also know what type of person I need. So if I recruit that person, then I need to provide that person with an environment where they can be themselves and create that feeling. And if I create that environment, I might as well put a manager there that knows how to manage those environments. So ultimately I know what type of manager. Nine out of ten go the other way around. They start with, the, I'm the manager, and I'm going to tell you how service is delivered. So we looked at it the other way around. And what we said is, how can we then hire people that have that ability in them? Should I then look at hoteliers with training and know how to make a cup of coffee? Or should I look at, uh, and, and search for very nice people? And now you all yell, Michael, you're going to look for? <laughs> Correct. So, what we do is we created workshops. With every new hotel that I open, I do the workshops while the hotel is still under construction. And we go online, we create um, a long list of applicants, and out of the applicants we screen till we have about 50 people that we invite for the workshop. And the workshop is four and a half hours on a Saturday morning. So if you want to be hired and you go for an interview that takes you four and a half hours on Saturday morning, uh, you might as well like that job, right? Then what we do in those workshops we basically uh, have screened the people, we uh, invite them to come in, and we do that in the construction site itself, because they might as well come to a place where they're going to be working and see what it is, how we create it. We register them, and these are our own Citizen M team members that uh, help out. But, for instance, these are two people that have absolutely nothing to do with HR, have nothing to do with operations, but they're there because they're passionate about what we have created together. After we have them come over, we do nothing. We have a good cup of coffee, we have croissants, we have danish, and we do nothing but observe. observe. And all of a sudden you see 50 people come in that don't know each other at all, 
but are all roughly the same kind. And we just start observing. And for about half an hour, you see those people come together and become passionate about just meeting each other. Well, they're human beings. That's, that's a first good step. Then what we do is we put them around, and you see a little bit how we decorate you know, the, the lobby then on the construction, and we welcome them. And during the welcome, I basically describe, as I did to you real fast, but a little bit slower, what we are uh, aiming for with Citizen M. So we gather them around, we give them a presentation, and as you see, it's not like uh, sit down and relax, though, this, you know, it's an active environment. And then we divide them in groups. And as we divide them in groups, what we do is we do different workshops. So what type of workshops do we do? The first workshop is you get blindfolded in pairs of two. And you do food tasting. Why are you doing that at a recruitment day? That's a strange interview. But what we see is teamwork, and what we see is trust. So you see behavior already that are, is deeply embedded in people. And you see it in an environment that they have long forgotten that they're for an interview. So that's the first session. Then we break and we go to the next, and again, we, for 10, 15 minutes, let them mingle. And the next one is we take, give them a piece of uh, white paper, we give them tons of magazines and say, okay, express yourself what Citizen M looks like to you. And you do that in teams of five. What they produce, unimportant. Very important, how did it work in a team of five? Is there one doing everything? Are they talking with each other? Are they sharing tasks? Is there individualism? So you all of a sudden see different elements again. And again, what the outcome is, is totally unimportant. This is one of those outcomes, and you see, it is unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> then, we take them to a workshop that is very, very important. We call it Hero. Here you see Mother Teresa, we show Nelson Mandela, we show some other um, great heroes. And I asked them in a group of 10 or 15 to think for a moment who their hero is. And not only who their hero is, but why. And then I asked them to write it down, so they go, I don't have to share it. And then just when they're done with that, I say, who wants to share their hero? And I have started after the first time I did this to bring a box of Kleenex, because I tell you what comes out is the most incredible stories of people. We had a Chinese girl that was interviewing with, our, with us and said who her, that her sixth grade teacher, English, was her hero. And when you ask why, she opened and gave me the key to the West. Well, that's somebody that is here willing to work and provide service. We've had the most incredible stories happen, and all of a sudden, as we take them through these workshops, we know exactly who they are. <coughs> so, we then ask our managers, who uh, are going to run the hotels to ter tell about themselves and engage them in a conversation. So the last workshop is more engagement than anything else so that there's a conversation going. We, uh, this, is, uh, this is the guy that does all the acquisition uh, preparation for us at the, at the company, but helps out obviously when we're doing the recruitments. Then when we start training, so I should back up for a moment. So the last thing we do is, at the end of the day, we basically tell everybody at the end that we will get back with them in 24 hours and tell them whether they're hired or not. So we know where they are the next 24 hours, we can reach them, and we also tell them that they need to keep the day after available to come and sign up. And when everybody is gone, on the way in we took a little Polaroid, a mugshot, and we put it out on the table, and within two seconds, those 50 are reduced to the 25 that we hire, by just done. And everybody's in agreement, because we have seen them. And then when we start training them and bring them in, it takes about a good three to four weeks before people have you know, given notice at their, uh, at their other jobs, are ready, and we start with our training. So in between, we bridge it, 
and we invite them for a drink or we invite them to the restaurant, only those 25 people that we hired. So they are not working with us yet, but we are inviting them to come and have a drink or, or dinner with us. And then when the training starts, the training takes four weeks, and I'm all talking about the first crew that we put in the hotels. And then we give them a training that takes four weeks. And who does the training? It starts with the architect, the development people, the acquisitions people, the partners go in there. Everybody that has a job within the organization tells them what they're doing at the organization, why they're there, and why they love the organization. And all of a sudden, the energy starts to build up. Then we give them some context training. Why? Because content important. Process, very important. Those two without context, go home. So we have to provide context. So by the time they start to grasp it and think, okay, so that's what a brand is all about, we say, no, now you got to go out. So we give them a brand experience and we send them out into the town and we ask them to come up with a list of brands and they go and visit those brands, whether they're hotels, restaurants, shops, whatever it is, and they go in as clients and see whether the brand promise and the delivery matches up. And they come back with all the observations you want them to have. And all of a sudden, what we tell them about what we believe Citizen M is about and how they can add to that and become part of that delivery, all of a sudden, their pride and their passion starts to grow. So during the training, we take them out on that excursion. We uh, invite them for drinks. And we really create a team. And what happens during that training they don't even ask to be trained on systems, on barista, on cocktail shaking, or on any task that we do have them do. Unimportant. But we slip it in. So there's a morning on, uh, on systems and there's an afternoon on that. And then we have them go to the other hotels to train. We have people from the hotels here go and train so that we set it up right. And then in the end, we create team members that are totally empowered. They're totally ready to go. Why? Because as a sponge that wants to soak up water, they emerged in who we are, and they came up. And they all of a sudden became our ambassadors. That's why the name ambassador. And when a guest walks in, they don't have a task. You have a task as guest. Their only task is to smile. And their task is to say, hi. And now you feel the passion. So it is not about did you have a nice trip, ma'am, it's about hi. And all of a sudden, there's a different load. These ambassadors, they are fully entitled to do whatever it takes with a guest. So if a guest experience, like anywhere, has a little bump or has a little problem, they can fix it. But because the human interaction is so important and prevails, there are no problems. It really is easy to deal with that. So, in the end, I think that when we have a team, we have high turnover because we use young people. But once we have put in that first team, and we hire new ambassadors, we have a training program for them, they have a buddy system to get in. Trust me, if we hire the wrong one, they can put it out of the system real fast. And just to make sure, because I like to be sure and, and, and not pray, we give them a salary that is in the industry, an average. So it's, a, it's an okay salary, nothing special. But every month they get 30% incentive if guest satisfaction is high. That wakes them up. So if the wrong person comes in and they don't feel as a team that can deliver service anymore, trust me, you're not welcome and you leave. And if it's the right one that can come in and participate, it happens. So two years later at Schiphol, a year later in Amsterdam, and in Glasgow opening, we have a passionate team that delivers innovative service in an innovative environment. And all we have done is taken the little word passion that really doesn't mean anything, but loaded it up. And that's basically our story. So here you see a happy ambassador. And if there are any questions, I gladly entertain them.
Yes. What do your managers do? Uh, what our managers do? Well, a hotel of 230 rooms uh, is uh, run in the morning by four ambassadors and a shift leader, in the afternoon by four ambassadors and a shift leader, and two overnight ambassadors. And they do about 180, 190 check-ins and check-outs, and do all the food service and provide all the, the award-winning service that we give. The manager is uh, somebody that is passionate, can guide teams, and their responsibilities are very limited. They need to schedule, so the team scheduling, which is very important. And the second thing that they do is ordering the food and beverage from bar stocks. We do the contracting, we do the accounting, we fill the hotels, we do everything else. So they are in charge of the team. That's their responsibility. And um, we had 45 GMs apply for us uh, in uh, Glasgow when we opened up this summer. And uh, people that have worked with great companies like Oberoi and were even educated by the Oberoi School. We had lots of managers and I hired a gentleman that ran nightclubs. No hotel experience whatsoever. But what he was good at was to coach teams like this. I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you. Yes. How, how does the housekeeping operation work in the, in the hotels? Very good. Um, as we looked at everything anew, I said, well, Housekeeping is really a, a specialty. So um, we felt that if you are good in facility management, you bring down the time and the quality goes up that is required, thus your expense. And then, as you know, in the hospitality industry, we don't buy our linen, we rent our linen that goes with the cleaning. And then I said all of a sudden, well, if I marry those two, and they do also my logistics of all the things that I store, in uh, the most expensive locations uh, in, around town, then maybe I can pay them by a uh, cost per occupied room. So I went to a, a large outfit here in Amsterdam or in the Netherlands that does facility management. They do uh, hundreds of hotels. I went to one of the larger laundry companies and I asked these guys to start a joint venture in a new company. And in my hotels, there are no storerooms. Um, and with the linen, all the amenities and, and, and the cleaning supplies get delivered. And uh, I outsource it completely. But what I did say is the individual that works in the back of the house needs to be identical to the one that is in the front of the house. So they wear the same uniforms, they get the same training, they get the same uh, TLC, Tamil Love and Care. And um, our ambassadors, incidentally, all our staff walks in through the front door. I have no back door. They eat where the guests eat, they eat what the guests eat, and I treat them like royalty because they're the ones providing the service. So we outsource the back of the house completely on a cost per occupied room. And they are so good at it that when we went to Glasgow, I tried to get two companies myself and get quotations, and they, with their knowledge, were able to uh, do more savings and pay for their own. So they now manage that whole process in Glasgow also. Hope that answers. Anybody else? Yes. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> do they also do the, the, the people involved in, in the back of the house also share in the 30 percent that you uh, that you use as the center? No, because they are uh, outsourced, so they are in a different uh, collective bargaining, a different CAO. So there is a different thing, but we do have incentives for them. So they, within their own uh, area, have incentives uh, on cleaning, on numbers room cleaned, and uh, what is very important for us is that they have the same uh, passion. And what happens, that's usually the group of people that have the highest turnover in every hotel, and we have very lo loyal troopers because they, they like what they're doing a lot. So, um, but that is not mixed, that is separate, uh, although it's behind the scene and, the, and the, uh, the staff themselves will not know. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, very good question. How do you measure satisfaction? Um, it's a little bit like passion. How do you measure it? Ugh, difficult. So we do it several ways. Uh, we look at our TripAdvisor comments daily. We look at other third-party comments every day. 
And we have our own survey, which is called a, um, uh, a survey that basically asks, would you, would you recommend us a net promoter score? And it goes from negative 100 to 100 positive. And we look at that every day. And when people are positive, we just thank them. Just only one question. Only one question. Would you recommend this? That's the most important. And when we're failing that, then our, our managers get in touch with you. And ultimately, because that's why I think you're asking who judges whether they get the 30%, there's only one god in the hotel, and it's the hotel manager. So we don't get involved in that. Why? Because that manager needs to get your attention. So you show up three times late, and they say, listen, please don't do that anymore. The month after it happens again, you get taken down. And if we want to, let's say, have people explore other opportunities, we basically uh, tell them, look, as long as you're here, you will never uh, get the 30% anymore. That takes care of that as well in rigid uh, environments uh, when it comes to labor laws. Last question. I don't know how we're doing on time. Go ahead. Uh, what about employee satisfaction? How do you test that? Well, we have not done it formally, I guess. Um, but um, what is important for, for us is that, that, that our hotels are alive. So everybody works in the hotels, hangs around the hotels. And what we notice is that there is, when, we, when we enter from the central office, it's energy neutral. Nothing, you know, we have a very good rapport, friendliness, it's open. And you can measure very easy whether people are satisfied or not. And the managers of the hotels themselves can go a little deeper and see what personal issues are. Uh, but a, a blank measuring we haven't done yet. Um, because we, we really didn't feel the need for it and it has never actually come up. We do meet regularly with them. So for instance, tomorrow I fly out to Glasgow and um, I meet with the staff to sit with them and hang. <laughs> Nothing on the agenda other than to get together. Welcome in Amsterdam. This is the Eurocree Daily. We share your passion for hospitality excellence.